<laughs> I'm trying to think the last time I saw you. I think it was Napoleon briefly, wasn't it? Kind of from afar almost in a way. Yeah, yeah. I didn't really, I didn't sadly get a chance to chat to you that. I know. Evening. But um, <clears throat> uh, we, I did that. I did a thing with Sarah uh, on The Crown. We did yeah. that podcast, didn't we? Yeah, uh, that was great fun. It's really yeah. nice to have both those worlds to be able to talk about that. Um, yeah, well, does it feel, is it weird actually that it's all, that that's kind of done? Because I imagine like the crown's been such an ever-present part of was, your world for, what, 10 years maybe? It's like a full-time job for, yeah, five years. Five, five years. years. Yeah. yeah wow. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it, when it was a kind of rolling cycle of work that um, came back. And normally I'm used to sort of moving from one project to another. But uh, yeah, no, it was great. Uh, you know, what a thing to be a part of. Well, I also it was just I, I actually I was listening to a couple of other podcasts that you were on and, and the early chat that we had for the Crown podcast back for season three, I think, was the original yeah, right. chat that we had. And um, I just I mean, for for a creative as well, the opportunities that it must have given you on so many levels for something that's um, chronologically updating as it goes through, you know, as it gets closer and closer to kind of current times it's going through periods mm. um was that something that you had to consider for this for the score kind of going through of almost kind of modernizing things in a way or was that never part of a conversation it, it's i mean when i joined because i joined in season three and yeah i didn't do the first two seasons and so already there was a big jump you know they changed cast every two seasons <coughs> Um, and already there was a big jump there, uh, and that's part of the reason I was brought in. I think to to try and you know to change the tone of the music and 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 move it a little bit more up to date. Um, but to be honest, when we were start, when I was starting season three, all I was thinking about was trying to make season three work and not really <laughs> thinking about what was to come, or even if I was going to be doing what was to come. So, uh, but those conversations did arise later on. Definitely, as we moved into five and six, particularly, um, and uh, it was, uh, it was. I mean, it was interesting. The um, so really, the conversations that we had when I joined in season three um, with Peter Morgan, who's the showrunner, were particularly about. He, he kept referring to this idea of suppressed power. And yeah. he wanted, he wanted the, the establishment, the, the, the feeling of the royal family is this incredibly powerful family, although it seems quite sort of uh, benign on the surface. But actually underneath it and the machine and the politics and, the, and its connection with Westminster, there was this, yeah, as I say, this, this bubbling power underneath. And, and he wanted that represented in the music. He wanted a, um, a sense that uh, a strength and a, and a might underneath the surface uh, in the music, so the music was quite muted, quite, but very big, and uh, uh, and uh, yeah, just felt like it was coming at us from underneath, and um, uh, that's that's very much how he wanted it represented in the music, and, and I uh, we tried early on to sort of yeah incorporate that, and so it wasn't about being very loud and bombastic, um, mm. it was about being incredibly in your face and, and, and lots of big fanfares and loud brass. And it was, it was much more about the, the restrained power of, of, of what we were trying to represent. Well, I think that that's the clever thing that the show did as well. And also those moments where they highlighted things outside of that kind of core royal family unit. You know, for example, yeah. I, I, was, I thought it was just really wonderful the way that they gave um, Muhammad al-Fayed, you know, a kind of uh, a history. And, yeah. and and that sort of side of things and, and really, you know, going, giving him a backstory and, and telling us a little bit about that background. And that for you, I imagine, as a composer and giving you that environment of Egypt and, and uh, you know, his upbringing, an opportunity to kind of explore what works with that sonically as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was sort of ironically that the hardest episodes were often when we stepped outside the world <laughs> yeah. and, and outside the family. And I think it was always where everybody struggled the most. And uh, Peter Morgan and his writers that, that you know, they, they found it the toughest, but often they were the most ended up being the most rewarding episodes. And, mm. uh, and certainly for me to score, uh, I, I really enjoyed that. I mean, that whole, and it was such a clever conceit, the idea of looking at, looking at 
the whole royal family from the position of an outsider and yeah. somebody who who desperately wanted to be in but but was pushed out and um that was again really interesting to score um we sort of came up in in seasons 5 and 6 with this this drum sound that um we uh, that I'd sample from from a recording of, of the recording of his wedding you know for the for the show they they did his wedding as as all this backstory of Mohammed Al Fayed and and I took a little piece of the the live percussion that they recorded on the day and sort of messed around with it and looped it and it became this kind of insistent beat in the back of Mohammed Al Fayed's head mm. him sort of driving him forward trying to you know his 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 ambition his his desperate desire to be accepted and ultimately pushing his son into the into that car on that fateful night kind of i mean that's unfair but but there is a there is a truth there too uh, i yeah. think that's what we were um we were yeah trying to look at um and then one of the other episodes that you know just to digress a little bit the you know again talking about going outside the world of the of the crown of the um of the family uh, one of the toughest episodes to do was the um, uh, when uh, Michael Fagan broke the story of him breaking into the palace, yes. the Queen's bed at the, uh, you know, she woke up in the morning and it was such a tricky episode to do because we moved into a completely different world. Uh, obviously, kind of, um, uh, yeah, kind of deprived 80s doll cues and um, uh, and then tried to match that with, you know, marry that, and those two worlds collide. And uh, but uh, it's actually one of my favourite episodes in the end. I love that. Yeah, it's a great episode. But that's the that's the tricky thing, isn't it? That you've got to give these these individual episodes their identity, but there has to be connective tissue between the rest of the Absolutely. show, you yeah. know, in a way as well. So that's kind of that's that's not an, that's not an easy ask, but it's your job. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. If I've got one job. Um, so yeah the connective tissue is really important and although we I mean I was basically working with Peter Morgan and the directors and and they wouldn't say this is what we need to be the connective tissue yes that's my mm. job to try and find that yeah uh, but when I sort of landed on something that they liked they would go yes this is a, like a sort of core part of, of the sound and um, the solo French horn being kind of perfect example um, uh, I mean, overall, the, the idea and something Peter was very into was being very singular, being very clear in the voice, not cluttering it up with music up with too much stuff. So he loved this sort of solo voice idea. Mm. Uh, and the French horn really captured the sort of... It, it really did a clever thing of, of giving us that sort of suppressed power feel, that, that, that colonial heritage, the, the, the weight of the, of the office... Uh, and, but then also the, uh, the there's a there's a tenderness and a sort of almost solo voice feel to it, um, and the loneliness of the office of the queen and and those in, in that in that power and the prime ministers too. Um, yeah, go on. Oh, I was just going to say another episode I was thinking about that's kind of that's that I really enjoyed, really clever was the Ritz one. You know, in terms right. of of yeah. that kind of uh, the idea of I mean that whole relationship of Margaret and Elizabeth is is just a beauty. You could have had a whole show just yeah, about yeah, yeah, about those, about those, that about those two yeah, yeah, and yeah. also seeing those different actors kind of play with that relationship as well and you know finishing yeah. with Leslie and Imelda but that yeah. lovely flashback moment you have to that night yeah, and yeah, you know yeah. and that's another another way that you've got to marry that that relationship of the music you know with the diegetic music that's in there on that night with kind of what you're then surrounding the rest of the episode with as well yeah 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 right um so i mean the sister the whole sisters idea was ran right through the all the seasons i worked on was very strong we had a cue called sisters and and it kept coming back and that was one of our sort of strong themes um uh and yes and it sort of culminated in that night and that i mean what what was done for the talking about the recording the the, the source the diegetic music the music that's in the scene that recorded in the club in the ritz uh, it was just so brilliantly done. I mean, that was Sarah Bridge and her team doing doing that. And uh, yes, and I, I worked around that, but it was, you know, that was that, that filled its own space and the score always kept a very different space to to the music, to either the needle drop stuff, you know, when they brought tracks into the episodes mm. or or stuff that was being played in the scenes. The score always had a, and I really appreciated this, it was always given a space very much on its own so you sort of really noticed when it was score and when it uh, and when it was other things. And, you know, 
you know, even though that you you know you say that that you came on in season three, there has been obviously introduction to new characters throughout the four seasons that you've worked on. Right. You know, whether that be William and Kate and Harry and you know and and loads of other characters really. You know, in terms of what they are bringing to the to the show and what you have to provide them with with regards to to you know score for that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was. The, the William, yes, I mean, absolutely, that was a sort of strong part of season six was, was something for William. Um, and it kind of came out of, uh, of of what we have for Diana, which made sense, obviously. And uh, Diana's theme was just this very simple arpeggiated harp. I mean, really delicate, really sort of vulnerable, but but elegant, I hope. Um, and... Mm. Uh, and touching and, 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 and sort of charged with emotion, um, mm. again, hopefully. Uh, and William's theme sort of came out of that sort of sound, that very simple plucked, plucked string sound. Uh, and again, very minimal, very, very intimate, um, sort of hopefully bringing your audience right in, in an intimate way with these very, you know, hugely famous characters. And that's, uh, yeah, what we're trying to do. That's such a lovely way to think. To, I hadn't really thought about that in terms of almost like the music of Diana that you created, which you did create, oh. uh, spawning in the same way as, she, you know, she's his mother. Her, yeah. his, her music is the musical mother of the music that they, that's such a lovely... Yeah, good. We really, really emotional. God makes me want to cry, to be honest. That's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a beautiful... You know, yeah. I think that that's the thing kind of where music is so powerful is that, you know, on on surface level of us just enjoying it and being in the moment, listening to it, watching it, it's yeah. affecting us without us even realising. Right, without any need for explanation at all. Yeah. But, and when you get into the sort of the ideas behind it, it's also interesting, isn't it? It's, yeah. yeah. How much of, of those kind of, you know, the conversations that you then go on to have with Peter and the directors and stuff... Are, are in the script how much i mean i've i've been, I've been lucky enough from being part of the crime podcast to to get those scripts and also just see the change in the scripts from you know you get a draft you get a draft of scripts through and then suddenly it's all it's yeah. changed and also the ep episodes as you see them edited yeah. i said it's been a it was one of my favorite things of being part of that 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 project was just getting to see that process of how things change and how things so you imagine you know for you as well in terms of that constant shift until stuff's locked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so so the, my process on The Crown was an unusual one in terms of, of how I would normally work on a project. Uh, I would write, I'd get together with Peter at the beginning of the, you know, really just even before they'd start sh filming the episodes with the scripts and we just chat about it. We'd play, play some stuff I'd already written. We'd play some other people's stuff. We'd, we'd generally just talk about tone and, and feel and and then I just go away and write a sort of album's worth of material and throw it at him and and he would go oh, that's awful I hate that that's rubbish <laughs> or, oh I really like that track that's brilliant I really it was always one or the other uh, and um uh and then we take the tracks that he liked and we sort of I developed those a little bit and then I just handed them over to the editors because as you point out that the episodes changed so fast and so radically if I'd started scoring them to picture early on, it would have been, I'd have just been chasing my tail. It would, the whole thing would have shifted under, under me. And, yeah. uh, and actually, they needed the music to work with in the edit. Um, and it's sort of quite a modern way of scoring stuff now is, is, is they have the music in the edit and, and they place, the editors place it, the directors place it, Peter places it. And, um, uh, and goes, this is the right thing for here. And they try, they shift out lots of different things. Um, and then it, it sort of evolves organically like that. And that's a really, that's very satisfying for, for the soundtrack overall. I think it really sort of feels part of it. It's not stuck on at the last minute. Yeah. Um, everything's really thought about and been considered a lot, each cue. I mean, often, and then I will get the episodes back, but I won't even be aware of how much thought has gone into choosing which piece of music went on which scene, uh, uh, at which moment. And, and that's, uh, so I was really appreciative of that because it, it made the overall experience and and also just allowed me to write the music rather than 
be constantly doing revisions and chasing a scene that was that was being recut or dropped or you know so mm. I'd write a great thing for a for a big scene and then suddenly it would disappear and you know that's quite disheartening and can sort of slow you down a bit. It was funny. I was uh, I was lucky enough to chat to Emma Corrin a couple of weeks ago. Right. Um, about um, about Deadpool actually, but um, we talked right. about the crime because I just remember this great story. It was it was it's so lovely because I did their first ever interview, you know, and it was before anyone had seen them as as Diana and um, and they were talking. We we talked about um, the the roller skate scene where uh, no the dance scene where she was in in reality uh, it was Shars uh, d- believe that. Yes that they were singing to and Ben Curran had to say we're gonna have to do it again Emma because we don't know if we can use the song and you were lip syncing for the entire yeah. duration <laughs> of this song yeah. and yeah. um and it's just that kind of uh, you know it was so many kind of collaborations on this show and so many brilliant directors who you know collaborating with 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 Peter on on how each of those episodes and those characters and those storylines and those relationships should be be kind of explored was that a, a a lovely part of it for you with regards to these this wonderful pool of creatives that you had the chance to collaborate with yeah totally i mean you just feel like you're part of this huge talent machine of of amazing people and i'm just a tight you know i'm just a, a cog in it and and but it's great to be whirring around with the whole you mm-hmm. know the whole vehicle pushing forward i mean it's that, I mean, just going back to that scene that you were talking about, that was that was great. I think they ended up with an Elton John track on it. Uh, and then we did something, score-wise, we, we sort of did something really unusual and we bought a, a, a piece of score in over it about halfway through that dance scene. And she carries on dancing to the Elton John track, but then the Elton John track sort of clashes with the score in this really horrible mashup, which is very much her mental breakdown and kind of feeling of distress at that moment as she has her dance gets crazier and crazier and and then it switches over totally to the score ending up on the shot of of Charles outside uh, sort of smoking a cigarette no no Camilla smoking a cigarette watching Charles leave the night before her house the night before the, the, before wedding, the wedding to yeah. Diana and it's such a chilling moment and and so brilliantly done I mean that was one of yeah one of my favorite moments in in season four actually yeah. The final episode, you know, Abe Daldry coming back. Yeah. Uh, and then just that, I mean, that genius, for anyone who hasn't seen it, spoiler, yeah. all the queens are there. That yeah. was, oh my God, it was so powerful. Yeah. Do you mind talking a little bit about kind of almost, you know, rounding everything up and the co- yeah. and kind of conversations around that whole idea yeah. of... Yeah, and, and sleep, Didi, yeah. sleep, and all that, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, with season six, Peter Morgan was quite, he was keen to kind of feel we were getting full circle on things and that we were coming back. And um, we started, he, he really wanted to sort of maybe bring in some of the, even some of the themes from the first two seasons, some of the brilliant stuff by, done by um, Rupert Gregson-Williams and Norm Balf. Um, and we incorporated some of those in 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 that season and uh, also then he had this idea of Sleep Deary Sleep which was written into the script and which was you know which they shot with a bagpipe player playing um, and there's a great scene earlier on where the where Pipes comes in she summons Pipes into her room and makes him play it you know and he's mm-hmm. like well this is going to create a terrible din you don't want this so <laughs> no, 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 play it to me and that's a fantastic scene and then So to do something with that for the final scene made total sense. And Peter was just like, look, here it is. Go and do something with it. Um, And uh, it was, uh, yeah, uh, it's quite a challenge because it's a bagpipe is is, is a very limited instrument. It it only plays in one key, really. And uh, it's all all, all, was very set in it in what pitch we had to do it in. Mm. Um, And, um, you know, only has a certain number of notes that it can play. So trying to build a track around it was quite um, quite tricky, but uh, yeah, yeah, I think um, I think we got there in sort of managing to morph out of it into something familiar from the crown and from the score, and then take us right through to the end. And yeah, it's a great last scene, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's, it's uh, yeah, bawling my eyes out. Wow, <laughs> it's so yeah, so so yeah. good. Um, and then you know, and then life after the crown, it's kind of back into 
to working yeah. on on you know kind of features and and you know a, and other projects yeah. as well and one of the first that we were we were um you know we enjoyed was napoleon i mean what an amazing piece <laughs> yeah. of work that was yeah yeah, yeah. very diff very different experience um uh and uh again just you know working with with a director showrunner with such incredible vision and and uh, energy and and yeah just a, an eye for something unusual and incredible you know yeah great great to be part of that how does how does how does Ridley work when it comes to music? So he's much more um, he's much more. I think he's got a much clearer idea of where he wants music to work, kind of what it's going to be, what the role of it's going to be. So it was much more like you know these are the sections we want you to score. Um, <coughs> he he wanted a lot of source music in there, um, uh, but he was also very good at giving me. Uh, sort of an idea, you know, he talked very well about Napoleon's character, about him not being a, you know, a polished aristocrat, about him being a uh, sort of a little bit of a ruffian in aristocratic terms, that is anyway, he was from Corsica, and he wanted that represented in the music, and he sort of talked about, yeah, the sort of shepherd song, the, the Corsican tradition, traditional song. So we latched on to that quite early, and um, it was a question of trying to run with that and incorporate it into the score, and 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 make that work um and uh yeah he was um he was yeah really good at giving me just the key steers at, at key moments um but i mean again you know a huge machine working so many stuff so much going on just mm. you know you see that film you just see the the amount of of energy and and creativity gone into every single shot there so um yeah it was uh, quite a thing yeah, it's the it's the it's the extremes of it, isn't it? Because there's the there's those extraordinary battle scenes, like and so many of them as well within the the show. But then yeah. those kind of intimate scenes, you know, whether it's the crawling across the table or yeah, yeah, the yeah, kind yeah. of you know the sort of that that relationship and that character as well, and those performances, particularly Vanessa and and yeah. and Joaquin Phoenix. Just, I mean, did you? You know, it's interesting speaking to composers for the show in terms of when people come on board and whether they're writing to script or whether they're writing to performance or yeah. whether, in fact, the, you know, like for for Joker and walking being given Hilda's score, yeah. elements of Hilda's score whilst shooting and it really informing part of that performance as well. So how yeah. did it work with, 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 with Napoleon? Yeah, I, I came on just as they were starting filming, so I didn't really get going until they, you know, the shoot was sort of nearing the end. Um, and again, it was, I was just, you know, Ridley and, the, and I also worked closely with the editors. They gave me some sort of quite clear steers and it was just like, go away and write some stuff. You know, again, I wasn't really writing to picture. <clears throat> uh, and you know, if you're coming on at that stage, it, it's it's not a good idea to start trying to write the picture too much because yeah. you know, everything is going to change. And and yeah, you know, thing about the crown is that it really, you know, I was lucky enough to come on to something that already knew really what it was. Yeah. You know? And and with with a big film, historical film like that, you know, it 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 may find take fi time to find its tone, trying to you know to settle down to what it what it's trying to be. Um, so, and I think, you know, and I did with the music as well. It took me a while to find the right tone that everyone was happy with. Uh, and it was particularly about, you know, it was really about being a, and that's why I think really so clever is it being a little unexpected with a historical drama like that. And mm -hmm. uh, quite a lot of the stuff I wrote, you know, it wasn't, it, it I w wasn't classic battle music. It wasn't classic period drama music. It was often trying to do something, yeah, maybe quite small, quite intimate. Quite a, from you know even in this huge story um and and to do the battle slightly differently i was really keen to not just have hammering <laughs> drums and, and yeah. you know uh you know just to try try and think so that's that, trying to incorporate the corsican music into that that really helped and uh gave us a different angle on it is that part of the, the sort of starting block then when you can you know when you have those discussions about that being a real kind of influence to to the sound then you've got to go and kind of research that and you've got to go and kind of yeah. you know yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. you know educate yourself further you know into yeah, what yeah, that yeah. what that is is that part do you enjoy that part of the job of kind of you know it's you yeah. constantly learning about different yeah different things right. i imagine as yeah, well exactly. and that's no that's a that's a real joy i mean that's you know i love listening to music and 
and and this sort of and this gives you a narrative and a direction in which to really get immersed in and um uh but it's a very you know it my my job's a very solitary job it's uh you know i'm i've got you know people to help me but in the end, I sort of have to be on my own. So I spend hours just sitting in, sitting in my studio listening to music, which is, you know, what a what a joy that is. Um, yeah. And and the, particularly the Corsican stuff, you know, trailing through loads of Corsican tracks and and different types of singers, and and then trying to source the singers and find who was going to do it for us, and you know, bringing them over and recording them, you know, which was a very tricky thing because they part of the, the thing about Corsican singing is all about Basically, it's guys in a room singing mm -hmm. with each other. They don't like to have be singing. They're not singing to anything else. They've got no okay. instruments. They don't have, or they, they might have, but it, but it's it's all about them and the harmonies that they create and the overtones, and they lean right into each other and uh, and just sort of kind of bounce off each other in the sound that they get. And um, but consequently, if you're trying to incorporate them into a soundtrack. You know, it's really hard. They, 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 I just about persuaded them to have a click track in their ear, so they could at least be in time with what I'd written. Yeah. But, but, um, but no, that pitch. was it. They wouldn't even have a note on a piano to start with, so the pitching was all over wow. the place. And, and, and that's part of the beauty of it was the, that it almost, it almost feels like it's about to fall apart and <laughs> really out of tune and horrible, but it doesn't quite. And that's that, that kind of little. In between space is really interesting music. I love that kind of. It's all slightly out of tune, but it's not. It's acceptable to our ear, and and then it's got a beauty in its own right. Uh, it's it's lovely to think about that tradition being passed down as well. You know, in terms of for how many hundred years has that been something that's been part of kind of Corsican culture, exactly. and yeah. and how do you become part of that, and at what age do you you know, and when yeah. do you yeah, 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 when yeah, do yeah, you yeah. pass it on and walk away and all that? It's like it's lovely. Yeah, yeah, and they're totally steeped in it, and 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 yet they may probably you know can't play, can't even read music. So always we would understand it. So it's like it's really you're entering a very different world and a whole wow. massive tradition. Yeah. Wow, that's that's um, someone needs to make a documentary about Corsican singers. That's well, sure. if you ever want to, Edith, I, I know a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what is next? You know, in terms of you know making the choices on what you want to do as a creative and and you yeah. know and, and learn and challenge yourself as you continue through your career and stuff what's informing your choices oh, it's really it's quite simple it's just kind of stuff that I might watch myself yeah you know, if, if if I like this if I'm the, you know and you often you don't know early on in the process how something's going to turn out but if it's like oh yeah I'd, I'd, I'd watch that and that that interests me and then obviously it's it's the people involved in it and uh, the the, the creative, you know, the, their history and what you've done, and if I've worked yeah. with them, and if they're nice people, that's also really good. Yeah, you want to have a nice time, don't you? <laughs> really nice. Yeah, that's, not that's always the case, but you want to have a nice time. No, no, but yeah. but but primarily people who've got a vision and feel like they're confident in being able to say that, and because again, if you, it's making making film and TV is so hard, <laughs> pull anything off. I've got such admiration for anyone who can make anything, and yeah make it really well you've got to have a real vision about what you're trying to do and um and really i just want to be you know i want to be near those people because it's it's a great joy to be part of that vision you know to yeah be inspired by their vision it really helps me write music and and get inspired by if, if they're really keen and i've got something clear clear yeah. to say. So, was um, there a was there a a, a particular character or relationship that you enjoyed writing for the most on the crown hmm good question i mean i loved i loved writing josh o'connor's charles in hmm. his three and four he was always i mean i just loved watching him you know yeah. while scoring him you know that was absolutely uh, uh absolutely gorgeous um there were some moments with olivia coleman as the queen that that i really um that the whole solo horn thing, her, her walk around ABBA fan <clears throat> in all that was incredibly challenging to score on sort of lots of different levels. But yeah, it, 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 it was so rewarding in the end. And I, I found that scene so affecting and, and, you know, that really great to be a part of. Um, I mean, both both diners were just brilliant and uh, both diners. I'm sort of 
nice thing to say, but um, yeah, you know what I mean. Um, yeah, totally. Uh, but it's also interesting to think about that that you that the that you were fed different things from the different actors who played the roles in a way as well. Yeah. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, they're they're they're. I mean, but again, that's the sort of odd thing is when by the time it gets to me, it looks so effortless what they've done and the tone they've created and the, and the characters they've made. And, mm. and I, it, you know, it won't have been, it, it, it'll have been, you know, they'll have gone through the same struggle that I do later when I'm seeing trying to hit that tone right. And I think that's what The Crown was so good at was, was it kept going until it found the right tone. Yeah. You know, and really. Yeah. Uh, but no, there's those... You know, the, all all the characters. God, they were all fantastic. Um, I mean, um, <laughs> totally blank now. Uh, Jonathan Price. Jonathan Price. Jonathan Price. Uh, yeah, I mean, there were some really chilling moments, clever moments with him of where he would talking about suppressed power, where he would seem like this benign avuncular figure, yeah, and then suddenly turn and be really really chilling yeah terrifying uh, and same, same with Tobias Menzies I mean who, who was absolutely great and I, I love some of his his episodes yeah the moon landing and the whole moon kind of story one. with his mum that was just, just yeah brilliant. it's brilliant and the whole you know uh yeah sort of mother daughter thing with him and his his mother and and what he was trying and his relationship with Charles great moment where where the night before um the night before, it's the funeral of... Uh, Mountbatten? Yes, thank you. Funeral of Mountbatten. And the night before, and, and um, Josh O'Connor comes back to see his, his father, Tobias Menzies, as Prince Philip, and, and, and he's <coughs> drunk, and he's aggressive, and but trying to be nice, and it's just such a fantastically written, active scene. There's so much. Yeah, There's I could so go much. Yeah, Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one last question before we go. Um, yeah. Is there a score for you that was either a kind of big inspiration for, you know, this wanting to be your world or mm. a score that you go back to again and again and again? Mm. That's a really good question. But give me a for the crown or for generally? No, for, for generally for you in terms of is there a, you know, is there a, is it a film or an experience that you saw as a as a kid or growing up before yeah. you were making film, you know, music for, for a screen that you were like, oh, that's where you really registered the importance and how powerful it could be? Well, well totally. I can t completely identify the moment for me that, that got Aww. me in, made me realise that this was writing music for film and TV was something really incredible was was seeing Michael Nyman's score for um, the draftsman's contract that, you know, and that can that can age me. Um, I think I was probably about 15 and I didn't even see it in the cinema. It was, I saw it on telly and I remember it just, there was a scene, it's called Shepherds Chasing Sheep or something. And it, this mad rock and roll, mm. sort of punk rock classical music came out. And I was just, I just remember just open mouthed, my God, I'd never heard score like it, you know. Yeah. And it was, it felt incredibly modern and, uh, and although I had quite a classical upbringing, I was always really drawn to, to commercial music and, and, and tracks and, and not, you know, wanted to move away from classical. But then the fusion of the two was just electrifying. And, and also the way it was mused. I mean, usually up to that point, score was very orchestral. It was very often very background. Uh, and, you know, and I had huge respect for John Williams of Star Wars, which was, again, a real, you know, real eye-opener. But actually what I really connected to was this, three chord four chord rep repetitive stuff it's very simple very clear and um although i don't really write music like michael nyman uh there was a clarity in it and a uh a, you know a, a, a simple drive to it which i absolutely love that's lovely because that's a a combination of 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 a lovely story from you but also a really great recommendation for people if they haven't seen the film as well so yeah, that's a, no, a double no, whammy for sure I, Absolutely, check that out. Yeah, amazing. Um, Martin, it's so great to catch up with you. Um, I'm really excited to see what. Do you know what's next, or are you just? Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. I'm working on a um, Netflix uh, spy series with Kira Knightley and Ben Whishaw. Oh, wicked! Um, it's really fun. It's it's kind of a little bit 
Mr. and Mrs. Smithy. I don't know if you've seen the Amazon series. Yeah, with Donald Glover. It's a very English version of that, but it's it's really good. And uh, uh, you know, and and just going back to your previous question, why you know what I'm doing, I, it was just so nice to do something completely different and do mm. some genre and. No French horns will be employed in, in the making. Oh. So <laughs> I've got an 11 year old who's on grade four at the minute. So he's right. he's he's coming through wow. on the French horn. Yeah, he loves it. Yeah. OK, great. Yeah. Great. Oh, okay. Um, available when you need him for the future. Um, when, French we horns. The, when we do the crown part two or the, see, the yeah, prequel. The prequel, maybe. I don't know. That's the funny is. thing about getting him um, going around to Peter's house to do those interviews for the podcast. You'd yeah. kind of the 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 we you know you, we built up a trust after the first couple where, you know we we did there was an element of proving ourselves in terms of you know yeah. what 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 we were going to do whilst we were there, but yeah. then it was just really we all just there was maybe three or four of us we'd go round to record in his house and we just felt such a treat to be invited into his house but I'd always be looking at his coffee table to yeah. see what books he was reading to try and get a like steer yeah. on what he might be writing next. Yeah, I, he's yeah. doing some really interesting stuff coming up. So, uh, yeah, but quite different, I think. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Let's love to mm. chat to you. Thank you so much for your time. Really, really appreciate it. You again. I hope I get to see you again sometime. Yeah, I hope so too. Maybe we can do something for the new Netflix show, for sure. Yeah, that'd be great. yeah, yeah. That'll be really fun. It's out on, yeah, it's coming out for Christmas. It's out before Christmas. Per so we'll perfect. Happy. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. What a lovely gift. Brilliant. <laughs> All, All right, right, Martin. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye. Bye.